Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Guys, that AC is really nice. They heard us. They, they knew we needed it. They heard us. All they that, knew we needed it. All that moaning. It's so hot in here. <laughs> it's so good. Okay, hey, everybody, welcome. It's episode 124. Today is April 1st, 2019. This is not a joke. You are listening to, or maybe even watching, <laughs> Human Factor. What? You did not. I did. This isn't a joke. This, this is Human Factor. This is factors. not a Human Factors this is, joke. This, this is, is a, real. This is, a, this is not a drill. This is Human Factors cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I am joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, hi. Hey, there he is. He doesn't know I was here. And uh, joining us again, a special guest, Elise Hallett. Why, hello. Hello. Welcome back from Healthcare Symposium. Thanks. Thanks. It's been a bit of a whirlwind coming from Chicago. I'm sure. How, so we, we got a lot to talk about today. Let's, let's just preview what we're going to talk about, and then we'll get into some of that juicy details. Uh, so we're going to talk about Stadia, Google unveiling their new gaming platform, if you're not a gamer, stick with us. There's plenty of applications outside of gaming related to human factors that you might be interested in. Uh, we're also going to be talking about an interface system with AR technology that could help people with profound motor impairments operate a humanoid robot to feed themselves and perform routine personal care tasks. I think that takes the cake for the longest uh, article title we've ever had. Seriously. And as well, we're going to take a peek into the future of wearables from IEEE. But <gasps> first... Uh, hey, everyone, go like and subscribe to us on YouTube. We're on there every Tuesday around noon. Thanks to Jeff. He's uh, cranking these things out really quickly. Um, please go like and subscribe. We need just a few more of you to get to 100, so that way we can get our slash name and help other people find the show. Uh, so I just want to know what's going on in your guys' world. At least I want to check in with you because you just did a fantastic job going to Healthcare Symposium and uh, getting a bunch of interviews with some of the top minds in the field there. So I, I want to know about your experience. Uh, well, it's a very open-ended <laughs> question. It was. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's let's start with the interviews. Okay. How did the interviews go from your perspective? Oh my gosh! Fantastic. So I did. What was it? Seven in total. I think which seven. Yeah. May not sound like a huge number, but when you only have two and a half days and you're cramming these things in between coffee breaks. Uh, I, I was really, really lucky to have that many. So huge shout out to all the people who graciously came and sat with me and my little table off to the side um, using up you know, their coffee breaks and to come and sit down and talk to me about what it is that they do in healthcare. So really, really awesome conversations with these folks. And I mean, for me, I learned a lot and how human factors can be applied in healthcare. You know, it's not just one way. There's so many different avenues that someone could take. Right, yeah. I'm, I think we did, what, 19, Blake, for... We human, did 19? I think we did 19. There's no way. And I remember that being uh, an awful lot for four days, and seven and two is, like, right up there it's around the, the same, same pace. Yeah. yeah. So huge shout-out to you, Elise. Thank you. Yeah, um, double high five. I know we've heard from a couple of our listeners, whoa, my headset is falling off. Look at this. <laughs> This is what you get on the YouTube part of it, folks. Yes. Uh, so I, I know uh, some of our listeners have given you a shout out. I have to ask you, who is your favorite? Nick, you can't ask <laughs> someone that. This is like asking a parent who their favorite child is. Exactly. Okay, okay. We need to know. Let me let me back. Okay, let me back <laughs> up then one step and say like, what was your kind of favorite topics to talk about? Not necessarily favorite person, but just when it came up in casual conversation. Now this could be not just in the interviews that you did, but at Healthcare Symposium in general? Like, what was your kind of go-to favorite topic? So, I don't, I don't know about topic. There are just so many interesting ones, and I'll actually talk about one of one session that I found really interesting that you guys might, too, in a minute. But I think one of the biggest themes for me that came out is, you know, at the company that we work at, um, we, we face this challenge with, you know, working as health or, uh, human factors practitioners working with other stakeholders and trying to figure out how to get human factors involved when a lot of people don't know what it is, don't know how to use us, don't understand the methods that we employ and why they matter. And it, it was it was kind of reassuring coming and hearing similar challenges with, you know, people, even if they were in a slightly different domain. It's, you know, kind of something that 
human factors in general is, you know, faced with. When I was in grad school, I didn't quite expect that. And being out in the real world, hearing about other people who are, you know, kind of experiencing it too and listening to what works for them and what doesn't is kind of a, a really great opportunity to, you know, when coming to these types of conferences. So that was one big theme that really stood out to me. Okay, so so walk us through what Healthcare Symposium is like. So you get there. What's the atmosphere like when you first show up? Uh, wh- like, what kind of um, what kind of presentation is it? Is it like Ergo X, where everything's on a track and you just kind of attend things throughout the day, or is it like HFES, where you kind of have your your way to pick and choose with uh, where you want to go, who you want to see? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a little bit of both. So when you first arrive, you have your opening. Um, you know, welcome reception the first night. So that was Sunday night. And uh, then Monday, you've got the opening, you know, plenary that, you know, t- talks about, you know, some some theme or, you know, larger uh, topic. I mean, for me, these things are always really awesome to open up the conference with because I find myself being really inspired. And then after that, there are generally four different tracks that follow kind of a different application of human factors in healthcare. So there's uh, the medical device and delivery track. It tends to focus on medical devices and those who are helping uh, build these devices, test these devices. There's the hospital environments track that uh, really focuses on human factors embedded within these hospital environments and how that is. And there's two others. So, I mean, it's just the, the fun part for me is there's interesting talks in all of them and coming and um, you know, so it's, it's a little bit like HFES where you've got the different tracks, but because all of this is healthcare, it's just even more focused. And then when you go into these sessions, it's kind of a mix of, um, you know, both talks similar to that you might find at HFES, but then also things that you can really apply, you know, lessons learned, things that are working for us, things that aren't working for us, and a lot more discussion-based. So it feels um, much more more open. You have a lot of people with the same interest of patient safety coming together and and just talking together, talking in this space of how can, how can we improve patient safety, whether it's from creating safer medical devices, from improving... Uh, you know, from a systems approach and hospital, you know, it's just so many different avenues that you can do it. You can find, you know, a space that's really interesting for you if you're interested in healthcare here at this conference. Very cool. Uh, okay, Blake, did you? So <laughs> from all the tracks that you went to, which one did you maybe attend the most sessions of or did you enjoy going to the most or feel like you learned the most out of? I found myself kind of gravitating towards these hospital environment sessions you know, partly because of what I mentioned before, where there's generally this theme of it's it's one human factors person, sometimes two, if you're lucky, embedded in these systems. And it's a little different. It's a little bit more challenging, I think, um, you know, because it's so new being embedded in these hospitals. So you're, like, trying to work with doctors and physicians and anyone else, and who you're reporting to is different depending on the hospital. And um, you're trying to navigate your way through all these different... Uh, you know, political factors and, uh, you know, just hierarchies and and figure out how you can get involved to really make an effective change. Um, I think part of me was drawn to it because from, you know, Department of Defense perspective, you know, you'll have one or two human factors people kind of embedded in this team that's very engineering focused. So, you know, even though you've got your, your program manager, there's requirements and test and evaluation. I'm constantly educating people what human factors is and so for me I found it really inspiring going and and talking with these people um, and you know hearing about their lessons learned even though it was in a slightly different domain it was just really really fascinating interesting so are these your notes from the healthcare symposium in front of you they might be okay so I've got (laughs) one more question because I I read it in your notes so you've got something about, about using escape rooms for assessing people's. Oh like, my gosh! Okay, okay, yes. we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm pretty sure <laughs> if that's in your notes, I'm pretty sure that's a talk, right? I remember hearing about it uh, with your talk with Tara, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay, let's let's get into sort of the the talks that you attended and and uh, kind of some some takeaways from those. Unless you have like something somewhere else that you want to. 
tackle this? Like, I mean, honestly, I went to so many different talks. It was really interesting. Um, and you absorbed all of it, and you remember yeah, everything absolutely. perfectly. So this yeah. is secondhand information, folks. Just, <laughs> it's just, just bear in mind. Even looking through my notes, I was like, oh, yeah, I, what I is guess that? I did sit through that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was... One thing that stood out to me, so last year, actually, when I was covering this conference, there was a talk about augmented reality and using that to support um, medical personnel in a combat situation. And with this, I mean, it was kind of a cool setup. I was sitting in this talk, and I was like, oh, this is fascinating, because basically had this mannequin that was, you know, just lying down. And using augmented reality, they could... uh, portray you know some kind of um uh they project scenarios on the yes thank you there you go yeah yeah absolutely it's four o'clock folks (laughs) (laughs) really struggling at the moment it's okay Um, i use that excuse every (laughs) single week (laughs) but yeah so (laughs) they late on a monday (laughs) they project um some kind of situation that basically this you know it could be like a perforated lung for example and what's neat about this is that you can see the change in symptoms over time so it helps with the diagnosis portion of um for these medical personnel so you can you can touch on both these primary symptoms, the really obvious symptoms, but then also some of these secondary kind of more hidden symptoms. So I went to that last year. It's pretty interesting. So this year, actually, I saw that they were presenting again, and uh, it was kind of a follow-on effort of talking about some best practices for augmented reality, especially used for training. Um, you know, things like, you know, this is coming off the top of my head, so forgive me. <laughs> but, no, it's okay. Um, you know, things like, you know, ensuring that you've got the, the scenario appropriate, um, you know, figuring out how you're going to to get the evaluator incorporated so in it. So quick, it's usually... Quick question on the scenario appropriate, the, the, the appropriateness of the scenario. What does that entail? Is that like how appropriate the scenario, like how, how uh, ecologically valid the scenario is, or is it uh, sort of how... Um, how appropriate it is for training purposes or like, can yeah. you elaborate on that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I went to a couple simulation talks and really one of the main points that kind of came up throughout was you need to identify the objective. What are you training them on? Why are you training them? What, what are you trying to get out of this training? And then matching the level of fidelity based off of that. Um, you know, in some cases, you don't need a really high fidelity simulation to get at the same objective, depending on what you're trying to get out. So it just it comes back to the initial question of why are you doing this? What are you doing it for? Um, but so that's kind of interesting. In the military context, did they? And I don't I don't know if this was appropriate for the same talk that you saw, but I remember the one we saw last year on this. I mean, was it? I can't remember if they had high fidelity or not in that context because I feel like there's so many variables that come into play when you're a field medic that it would be important to like not have the most high fidelity thing, like you can feel the wind on your face type of stuff, but at least like a lot of different variables that could go wrong. And I think I remember that being like a focus of some of their research before. Did you find like levels of fidelity depended on like how complex the environment they were going to be operating in was? Kind of, but it also. Uh was impacted by the level of of how the facilitator was going to get involved. So, you know, as this person's going through, so the idea is, you know, it's a group of people who are going through some kind of course, and they've got a facilitator who's kind of controlling the scenario. So based off of what the person is is seeing in, in their, their eyes, looking at the patient, um, you know, based off of how they're proposing, you know, to treat or what they're paying attention to, then the facilitator can actually adjust the symptoms based off of that. So that, in one sense, um, you know, was was an interesting element in that, you know, if you're focused on the wrong thing, then the facilitator can actually come in and, and adjust the, the play out over time. Oh, so is the facilitator basically manipulating some of the variables you're experiencing? Oh, I got interesting. You. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like this uh, this person that interjects different things going on, so that way the uh, the trainee has to react to these different scenarios, right, when they don't know what's coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Okay. So that was interesting. Um, yeah, so a lot of, lot of stuff about simulation, um, but generally, you know, like I said, really comes down to the objective and, and what you're trying to, to accomplish with it. Um, the other one... 
stealing the simulation has to do with this escape room. Okay, so I, I heard this in your talk with Tara, and I was so intrigued. Um, I just had to ask you about it on the show. What's the deal with escape rooms? Have you ever done one? I have what? not. However, I have a sick fascination with them, like ah. uh, to the point where like I've devised how to put one together myself. Uh, and yeah, You've I've never, never done, done one. one. I've never done one. However, I've seen. I can't even believe it. I know, right? That seems like something right up my alley. Anyway, well, if you have a fascination with it too, and you're gonna like you can put one together, I'm surprised you haven't done a bunch. Yeah, That's awesome. No, I know. I, I, I've seen a lot of TV ever show the episodes, guys. I know how it goes. Uh, <laughs> I'm an expert, okay? So, Tara, if you're listening, you know expert. who to uh, call up if you need help with puzzles in the future. <laughs> I mean, I do. I do, like, have a sick fascination with them. I don't know what, like, the, the like, have you guys ever seen the Saw franchise? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's kind of... The <laughs> ultimate escape room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me just comment on that. I'm a, I'm a I did an escape room recently. It was basically Saw-themed. <laughs> oh, my God. That's it, perfect. Honest <laughs> to goodness. No, I... <laughs> I was... I was blindfolded. <laughs> they led me into this crate, and each person had um, was was in their own space in this room, and each person was blindfolded, so you had no <laughs> idea where you were. It was terrifying. Like honestly, it put me right. Like I never watched those movies. There's a good reason why I don't watch those movies, and here I was living it. It was awful. Um, and so I'm I'm in this group. It's five, and I went for my friend's birthday. It was her and her husband. And then another couple who I had met the day of. And, like, I, it was to the point I couldn't even remember, like, the other couple's names. I'm really bad with names. Um, but we, we go into this. And let me tell you, I got closer with everyone in that room because they oh, saw yeah. a side of me. I'm sure no one in this room has even seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, it was just, it was so immersive, which was crazy. I mean, it, it didn't take a whole lot to get us in that frame of mind um and yet it it was just like immediately like the second those blindfolds came off all of us were in this different mentality and the cool thing about this room was it it forced you to work together in a way that a lot of other group activities just haven't done it for me before like if you ever gone to the ropes course or they're like lean on each other and try to get this hoop through your legs and yeah i mean it's it's great but here you here. really have to like play to each other's <laughs> strengths, like <laughs> absolutely. Hey, I I'm mean, good with math. Let me take this one, or yeah, exactly. Because a lot of times there are clues in one area of the room, and it goes to some some key or lock in another part of the room, and so you're you're located far apart. So you're having to coordinate with each other. You're having to clearly communicate to each other, and. In my case, if it's terrifying, you're doing it under very stressful conditions. <laughs> So, I mean, it was just, it's such a fascinating thing for me, having recently gone through it. And and then going to this panel. <laughs> and then going to this panel. Can um, I just interject really quick? With sure. The, with this, there, there's this thing, I don't know what it's called. It's here in San Diego. They'll, it's like a Halloween experience, right? And, and um, talk about immersion. You have to sign a waiver that lets, like, these people basically handle you and gives them permission to, like, shave your head that, and, what? like... Yeah, this is this no, is. No, oh, is that the thing at Knott's Berry Farm? No, no, I've no. I've heard of this thing where no, they'll that's like not there. take you. No, that's not there. But the, it, I don't know where it is, what it is. I just I heard it. But the, you have and, to sign a waiver. And that, the shaving your head is part of it. Uh, it possible. could be or tattooing or like there's yeah there's like permanent things that they can do that you have to. It's like an extreme experience that for people who like really want to get scared, they like you know. Uh, throw throw a bag over your head, throw you in the trunk, like take you to a different location. Like it is intense. That's too much for me. Escape rooms are good. Anyway, yeah, escape that rooms. one sounds insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they can Hell. shave your head, and tattoo you. Okay, cool. They just let you back home next week. You'll be all right. It's just something that you look up on the side and. Just... No, I don't remember. I think I heard it from one of our colleagues. Um, so. Well, surprise. Okay. Well, yeah. stay away yeah. from that colleague. Thank you. Uh, well. <laughs> The <laughs> Pretty far from I, that colleague. The escape room I went through was uh, good enough for me. Oh, okay, goodness. all right. So let's let's get into this chat though. The, so, the talk. Yeah, Tara's escape room was not scary. Oh, did you actually get to do one in the like at the actual conference? No. Or was it just like her that talking been awesome, about That would awesome though. Yeah, she was explaining. That Excellent. was actually one of the first things that she stated. It wasn't a scary one, um, but basically. Her her thought was, what if we can use these escape rooms uh, to train teams, basically, or study teams? Um, 
and look at the the team cohesion. So she had it, it was kind of funny. She's telling us a story about how she was recruiting her participants, and when she first started, she expected you know maybe two or three, but she ended up getting. I'm sorry, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. A lot, like, a lot, <laughs> a lot. And uh, the, to the point where actually some departments would come back saying, hey, we, we want to sign up more people for this. Can we do that? <laughs> so it uh, was really popular. I mean, for her, it was just, you know, advertising throughout the hospital. Hey, this is something you can do with a team. And so it was getting all types of different teams. Um, you know, surgeons, physicians, even uh, like HR folks, administrators, just the whole gamut of, you know, hospital representatives. So that was really interesting. And then her escape room, you know, kind of like the one that I experienced, she really focused on um, the puzzles that required people to work together so that they could look at, you know, how are they communicating? How are they working together? Um, they, you know, took a number of different, you know, studies just, or uh, measures, sorry, that they're still in the process of analyzing and looking at. Um, but one of the things that they're going to be looking at in future studies is how do these different roles play into this? Um, and one of the things that kept running through my mind was here you are kind of dumped in this totally new environment. You know, in, in her game room, they, they actually had lab coats and oh, it was this cool. infectious disease that was coming out and they had to escape before it, it hit that time. So, you know, there's still that time element, that pressure. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of this new environment. So you're here working with the same people that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. But in this new environment, new scenario, figuring out how to work together, it's, I just find it fascinating. Like, it's such a great idea. So let me ask, in, in that type of situation, there is the opportunity for failure, right? There's, there's the opportunity that the stress might be uh, so intense and, and maybe not in this particular escape room. However, th there's the opportunity that stress might be so intense that it actually uh, impairs the working group cohesion among the group. Did she talk about that at all? So she actually talked about different roles. So they, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the details, but uh, she, you know, basically they, they took part in some kind of survey that, that talked about what kind of role they naturally fell in in, in teams. Um, so, and she found that there were certain types, types that were more organizers and this didn't necessarily have to be the actual leaders in, you know, the social hierarchy. Um, you know, it, it could be anyone, it could be a nurse, it could be, um, you know, HR, it's anyone. So like personality traits rather than. Exactly, exactly. And so some of the initial findings, still preliminary was that, you know, having these people with more organizer-type personality roles tended to be correlated with success. And then people who had these challenger personality roles, challenging, you know, people's ideas, um, you know, pulling them away from kind of the main task at hand, like, we should be focused on, on this instead, um, they were kind of attributed to, um, you know, more, more failure rates. Mm. So... You know, they were all kind of under this stressful situation, but there were certain personality traits that almost provided a bit of resilience in it. So it was hmm. kind of interesting. I'm really looking forward to, <laughs> like, seeing when these results come out and some of the, the um, implications that they come together. It might be useful to even understand your own kind of personality type under that kind of stress. Like, are you, are you somebody who's ultimately going to detract from the situation? And then when you know that, if you're in a real world problem like where there's a you know a cdc warning that there's an actual infectious disease you already are aware that okay i tend to do this and i know it doesn't help my team solve problems what can i do differently um or how you can just i help fall. guys <laughs> how can i help <laughs> i don't know what to do <laughs> yeah so okay so that's really cool i i wish i i i, I want to know tara's a listener right yeah yeah we need to get her to post <laughs> yeah we need to get her to post those uh post those results in slack i'd love to dig into them um do you have any other things from Healthcare Symposium? I mean, I know there was a ton there, but, I mean, anything else you want to talk about? Not at this time. Okay. I mean, really, <laughs> it, was, it was a really great experience. Uh, the whole thing was just 
put on very, very flawlessly. It's a great conference if there's someone who's considering going into healthcare or just wants to learn more about how human factors gets involved in healthcare. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully if you are interested in healthcare, you had the opportunity to go listen to those bonus episodes that Elise has recorded for us. Um, <clears throat> they are interviews with some of the top minds that have attended the conference, so please go check those out. Um, I think for now, you know what time it is. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's time for Human Factors News. It's been a while since we did this, guys. So this is uh, the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of, you guessed it, Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, AI. What? Stop <laughs> laughing, Blake. I do this every week and you never laugh. Okay, anyway. Uh as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it's fair game for us to talk about. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so tech giant Google is getting into gaming in a big way with a direct challenge to the giants of the consoles and PC gaming. It's called Stadia. It's the core of what it, what it's going to be in gaming. It's a gaming platform that runs via streaming, so not no console or PC and game and no games downloaded or running on a disc at the user's end. So Google argues that its custom hardware net network can often high enough offer high enough quality to satisfy and even convert people used to buying games on disc or downloading them. The company prototyped the Stadia tech last fall by allowing users of a program called Project Stream to play Assassin's Creed Odyssey in Google's Chrome browser. I think I remember this. So a Google PR rep told Kotaku, I always mess that name Nailed up, <laughs> that Google's Project Stream was available was going to provide 1080p 60 fps or feet per second frames per second excuse me gameplay for users with 25 megabits per second connections so stadia will work on tvs tablets laptops phones then it'll work with existing controllers when playing on a laptop and pc stadia will also have its own controller the stadia controller which is optional connects to google's streaming data centers directly over wi-fi for limited latency and Google will reveal more about the platform launch lineup over the summer. Okay, so I I have to make a confession, Dick. You didn't watch the video. I didn't watch That's the okay. video. Okay, let me this break this down. This is intense, though. Okay, this is very intense. So this is this goes beyond just streaming games. So there's a couple things here that are going to like. Let me let me just kind of um, back up really quick. So there's been a lot of criticism about this. Uh, a lot of people have been really critical of this announcement thinking okay streaming is how are you going to do that how are you, the latency issues you know games are an interactive medium how you know like response time is important how are they going to do this um i don't remember if we talked about it on the show i remember definitely seeing it in our feed that uh google a while ago did uh, came out with some technology that allowed them to compress images at high resolutions uh that were you, you'd be able to load an image really quickly um, because it used less data, but it still produced the 4K. So it compressed pixels um, in areas that it needed it and didn't compress them in areas that didn't need it. Uh, and so the result was a 4K image over a lot less bandwidth. Now we know why. Most definitely, yeah, because um, that seems like a great application of that. Yeah, so so again, there have been a lot of criticisms about like streaming. We're not going to get into the, some of the criticisms today. I just want to talk about what this announcement kind of means and what kind of impacts in the field of human factors and especially on on the way we interact with technology is going to have so um the sort of basis of this is that yes it's a streaming platform the console itself is literally just hosted on google's servers so you boot up a game by going to your chromecast or your web browser or whatever and your wi-fi is your your controller is connected to wi-fi and you can pick right up where you were. No booting up necessary because it's just on Google servers. It's going. Um, the place where this gets really interesting is how it interacts with the ecosystem and what this means uh, for virtual environments. So I'm obviously really jazzed about this because of virtual environments. Um, let's start with this first sort of example here. Uh, no download, no patching, no nothing. You. you you never have to patch another game again. You just get in and get on. You're there. That seems like it incredibly impossible to me for some reason. It seems so just outside of my realm of understanding. Why is it impossible to you when, when it's loading up on Google servers and they just keep a save state and then all they need to do is just boot up their processing power and go from there? 
Yeah, I mean, they're just. I mean, it sounds like they're just running a bunch of VMs all over the place, and they just keep them updating, which is that's just insane. But to get this kind of bandwidth for like a video game, especially from the quality people expect from them, and like the interaction latencies and all that stuff, these guys have really done something that's going to go far beyond just playing games. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's another kind of aspect of this that I want to touch on. So they made a lot of uh, sort of. Okay, let me let me tell you what this reminds me of. This reminds me of that first time Steve Jobs got up and showed the world the iPhone, because I think this is going to fundamentally change the way that we game. Uh, that's my opinion personally. Like I think this has a lot of potential, and there's a, a, you know the streaming restrictions are the, people are going to have to get over that, and uh, you know technology will have to overcome. And once we get past that latency issue, if it is an issue, I don't know. Um, then I think we're in for something special here. Um, I think it opens up a new door for how we just interact with each other. So let me touch on that. So in Google's uh, server box, right, they have my instance running. They have your instance running. And let's say you come over to my house and we want to play the same game. We can do split screen, but all that processing power uh, to split the screen and render two separate images, uh, you no longer have to split the processing power. It's just happening on their servers. So there's two separate things rendering everything for us, meaning no processing power is sacrificed. Oh, wow. So now think about that in the application to like a squad-based or team-based game where I can put your screen up on mine and it's, it's since it's Google's data center and you're sending data to it, it can just send that back as one picture. So I can see your screen, I can see your screen, and I can say, oh, hey, you have somebody on your left. Uh, this would make Apex Legends insane. It would, right? <laughs> it totally would. So, uh, hey, where'd the AC go, by the way? It's, real hot it's gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see beads of sweat on all of our foreheads. Yep. Um, so so th- the fact that not only does it not sacrifice processing power, it could introduce new roles into those types of group-based projects or games, right? Like, at least you're not a gamer. But what if you could look at my screen and look at Blake's screen and kind of act as a coach and kind of be a third eye for us and say, hey, you got someone on your left. Maybe you're not, like, as dexterous. I don't want to say, like, you're not, you're not good at playing games. I just say, like... No, I'm terrible. Okay. I'm the one that's in a corner, like, trying to figure out how to get out of the corner. So let's just say you're not as good with, um, with playing with controllers or something, but you still want to contribute. You could look at both of our screens as a spectator and... Uh, be the backseat gamer. Yeah. You could say, hey, look, look off to your left. There's a person over there. Or be the coach, right? And be like, hey, you should have done this, that, the other thing, right? If you understand the game, you can do those. Um, so think about that. And then, so that's the group aspect of it. I don't know if we want to jump into that at all, but I thought that was really cool. That's kind of like the coolest thing to me. I think that that has such interesting dynamics for how, like, because how games are played, yes, but even like doing, you know, team-based events, like things that you try and get more people involved in or trying to do like team building at work or anything like that. I mean, I think it, it gives you an ability to play games differently because some people just don't either know or enjoy playing video games, but this could right. give others a, a way to interact with like a group of people that they don't normally play around with or like spend any time with. Right. So it's got a lot of social implications, but I, I, I'm wondering how this applies to just, you know, outside of just video games itself, just having that kind of processing power where you could have an experience that a lot of people are tuned into Across yes. the world at one time. Okay, yes. So let me get into that. So they do have all this processing power. And because they have so much processing power, you're not limited to the same sort of constraints that a normal console might have. So rendering an environment um, is, takes a lot of processing power on your console. So imagine a world in which you have a fully destructible environment, all these particle physics, that can happen now because you are sending data to the data center and it is sending you back a picture and all the like calculations actually have on, happen on the server. So you can think about it like if we were sharing the same environment, all three of us, uh, each one of our consoles would have to render what's going on where as for Google, like they just had to render it once and push that image back to us um, because it's an environment. They're, they're taking it from that perspective. Uh, now think about like that application to other things. Like instead of a hundred people battle royales, you have thousand people battle royales. Uh, 
I know that's something Blake probably yep. excited. Yeah, super yeah. excited. Yeah. That'd be insane. <laughs> so Imagine the map you'd have to build. Like it, that just even changes the scale of how you build. How video many games maps? Even yeah, more. yeah, it does. Holy cow! Um, and because imagine like the map that we play on for Apex Legends. It's pretty. I mean, it's everybody knows by now. It's small enough. It's got like right. you know twenty teams, so that's like sixty people at max. I think. Yeah. Uh, if that was multiplied by even a hundred, it would be insane. Imagine thousands of people. Right. And think about space. like how far you'd have to go to get that circle. You know, so in traditional battle royales, you have this kind of circle that keeps coming in towards. It funnels all the players into this one spot over time. And, I mean, you'd have to cover so much distance, you know, for a map that big. And imagine, like, if it was fully destructible, if you shot bullets into a wall and the wall started to crumble and the whole building crumbled, it could handle that. Yeah. So it becomes a lot more dynamic. Um, and the and, fidelity probably could get really insane. Uh -huh, yeah. Ooh. And it, it, you mentioned it in the blur, but they're streaming at 60 frames per second at 4K HDR. So it's like, that's, that's some pretty good quality. That could get really uh, scary really fast. Yeah, it could, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking about this. Uh, they're, they're, okay, hang on. I'll get into the future human factors applications in a minute, but there's a couple other things that I want to talk about here. So because it's tied into Google's data centers and Google's sort of ecosystem, there are ways in which you can interact with it uh, from other avenues. So like, think about you're watching a video on the newest video game or whatever, and at the end of the video, it says play now. You can literally just hit that, and your your um, your screen becomes the video game, and you can start playing right then and there. Low level of cost to like entry or anything. Yeah, that's insane. There's also other applications like, uh, so it comes with Google Assistant. So you can say like, let's say, and it's all it knows where you're at in the game at all times. So you can say like, Hey Google, how do I get past this? And it contextually knows based on your X Y Z position, what level you're on. All that detail, it knows. So it can pull up a, a YouTube video, and if somebody else has done that same thing at that same exact XYZ position, it knows how close it is, and it knows what it needs to do to get past that stage. So you can literally pull up an overlay YouTube video in that moment and say, how do I, how do I fix this? And it'll show you the video, and then you could just do it alongside the video. You don't have to manage what? multiple scripts. Right? And it knows contextually, how do I, how do I solve this? And That's the crazier knows. part, like it understanding based off of just your position in the game and even being able to save state like that and you be able to walk away from it and come back and be immediately where you started. Yeah, and that save state is a little bit interesting too because it's not just, you know, I'm picking up back where I left off. Let's say I've encountered like a bug, right? And I'm stuck in an area. I can generate a link and send that to a developer and say, hey, I'm stuck here. And they can see exactly where I'm at. They can pick it up. And they can control my game, although it's a separate instance on their end, right? So, like, let's say, hey, I've made this really cool level, but you have to start in this very kind of specific position. I can send you a link. You'd already be preset in that position, ready to go. Um, or, like, you know, like, let's say you can't beat something, and I've beat it, and you just want to get to the next, like, I'm thinking, like, one of the, the Dark Souls games or something where it's, like, super hard, right? I can't beat this boss. Okay, well... Here's a link to the, you know, right after you beat that boss. Um, this is totally like the precursor for something like Ready Player One. It really is. It, it definitely. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, the baby version of it, but just the ability to handle all that kind of bandwidth is this ability to drop you in in different instances and all the things being so interconnected. I feel like it's step one. Right. So one sort of last uh, last piece here is that, like, Let's say you're a streaming personality or something, and a lot of people, I don't know, th th this could be a desire, right? Like, hey, I want to play with Blake from Human Factors Cast on Apex Legends. And so there could be like a queue system where you basically open it up to your viewers on Twitch, and what happens is they hit play, and then they are in your game That's amazing. just from there. Uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe they play one game with you, and then they're out. And then the next person in queue comes in. And so... There's a lot of applications. Okay, so I want to talk about this outside of video games because this is where it gets most interesting to me. Think about, uh, because all this processing power is happening on Google servers, Google, okay, this is where my brain goes immediately. Google has uh, a VR headset called Google Daydream. Um, and if we can get over the latency issues and the lag associated with control inputs, uh, you could stream HD 
4K HDR 60 frame per second video to a headset with these environments, okay? Now, think about the processing power required for some simulations. Let's take the example that you said earlier, at least, like with the, um, with the, uh, the body, with the AR, right? Let's say you're doing it in VR, and this body now has realistic blood physics, so you can react appropriately. Like, let's say you accidentally cut the wrong thing, and blood squirting everywhere. Uh, that's a theme tonight on tonight's show. Is Apparently, blood, yeah. Blood and fear. But let's say you do that. You then have sort of this realistic, you know, the fidelity goes way up at no cost of processing power to the actual VR headset or anything tethered to it. It's just projected through Google's data centers. You could put together something um, basically so big, so powerful, uh, and stream it to a, a phone headset. Like Google Cardboard could probably handle it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be games. Another thing that kind of came to mind as you were talking through this is if you run into a situation where you've got a question, you're not quite sure if you're doing stuff right, pulling up information kind of in situ to get that help. One of the questions, I think, with uh, using simulation in an educational environment is how to incorporate um, you know, this, this facilitator in a non-obtrusive way because, um, you know, your, your sense of presence is kind of juggling between the physical world and this virtual world. And, you know, as you tackle on the stimuli in the physical world, you kind of start leaning towards that way. So it could be obtrusive if you have someone kind of standing next to you, talking to you. Right. But as you're talking through this, you know, like Google Assistant, hey, Google, like, how, you know, how do I assess the situation? How do I fix this? Right. These are like natural, intuitive interactions to get more help or to get that assistance kind of in situ of what you're doing without breaking you from this right. virtual world. Yeah, you could have that instance where you cut an artery and that's a mistake and you say, okay, Google, how do I fix this? And it knows that you've cut an artery and it shows you like an overlay YouTube video right in your eyes that says, okay, here's what you do. You apply pressure here. And then you um, bandage it up like so, you know, and, and thinking about that aspect for training, like I, I'm a firm believer that this is going to change the way that we think about things when you have everything kind of hosted on a central server and uh, all the processing power happens there. I think, I think the world really kind of opens up because you are no longer limited by com computational power limitations when, you know, Google's data centers will help it all, you know. I don't know. I, I'm really excited about this prospect, and... and It's pretty clear, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, think about the data collection and analysis, like, power that that has. And over time, I mean, you could even... You could get beyond just training people. You could be putting this kind of glasses on that's overlaying on a body, and Google yeah. is what's stopping you from making that artery cut because it knows that 90% of the time people have your training level make this mistake. Yeah. And here's how we here's how we can make sure you, that you do avoid it. Yeah. Uh, so it's I don't know, that's it's kind of scary intense the amount of like awesome technology there is and then the data collection power behind it. You get to see so many trends and how like human evolution will change. Can you imagine like a machine learning algorithm behind the scenes that generates its own content based on um sort of player habits? Oh yeah. Or if you want to take it one step further, your own mind. Yeah. Just the, the plug-in BCI. Yeah. Anyway, this is, yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, but, man, we've been going for a little bit, so I need to take a little break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc., we're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. 
Thank you all. And remember, it depends. I forgot to mention, if you want to nerd out about Google Stadia, you can find me on Slack. I'm happy to talk about that with you at length. Uh, I have so many more thoughts that I can't air on the show. Um, But very exciting. Anyway, uh, I want to thank all of our friends over at Kotaku Futurity, I think, and IEEE Spectrum for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media. Uh, We started posting a lot more of those. Or you can join our Slack for links to the original articles. Uh, Okay, we... Uh, time's time's tight, but let's go ahead and tackle this next one. Let's do it. Okay, so an interface system with augmented reality technology could help people with profound motor impairments operate a humanoid robot to feed themselves and perform routine personal care tasks, such as feeding and performing routine personal care tasks. Oh, excuse me, guys, such as scratching an itch <laughs> or applying lotion. So the web-based interface displays a robot's... Uh, robots eye view of surroundings to help users interact with the world through through the machine the system could help make sophisticated robots more useful to people who don't have experience operating complex robotic systems and study participants interacted with the robot interface using standard assistive computer technology access technologies such as your eye typical eye trackers or head trackers that they already have used to control their own personal computers The paper reports on two studies showing how such robotic body surrogates, which can perform tasks similar to those of humans, could improve the quality of life for users, and the work could provide a foundation for developing faster and more capable assistive robots. This is an awesome story, and shout out to Elise for sending it to us, because this is really good. Elise, you picked this one. Yeah. (laughs) What did you think when you first read it, Elise? I'll give you first dibs on this one, since I talked so much during Stadia. Or did you just (laughs) read the headline? Uh, No. I read most. (laughs) (laughs) I skimmed. I I skimmed it. (laughs) No, I mean, I think one of the the biggest things that called out to me here is this feeling of empowerment for people. You know, if you're in these kinds of situations, I mean, anyone really who kind of goes through the hospital system. I mean, myself, I, I know someone like very close to me just recently was in the hospital and it, it wasn't anywhere to the degree of these, but I think this loss of control is this huge element of, um, you know, well-being, you know, thinking about how you're going to tackle whatever it is that you're going through, I think really affects, you know, how you go about uh, living your daily life. And, and sometimes, you know, people get stubborn and don't want to ask another human right. for help. And, but, you know, having something that's in your control that you, you don't have to wait on, you don't have to, to ask, you, it's like an extended tool, basically. I mean, I just think is really fantastic. Yeah, so they did this, uh, they did a series of case studies, and one of them uh, was focused on user empowerment. And, and this guy, Henry Evans, um, who actually lives here in uh, California. He actually has very limited control of his body, and he tested the robot at home for uh, a week. And um, he, they, they say that he not only completed tasks, but he kind of used it in novel ways, combining, you know, one arm. Like, he's using both arms at the same time, one to kind of control a washcloth, another one to use a brush. Um, and uh, combining the motion of both arms was not something that the researchers expected. So... Th- you know they're they're finding ways to to interact with this world that they typically can't because of lack of mobility. I think that's really cool. It's probably the most surprising thing for a lot of people to develop some of this technology too is you just those unintended consequences of what you provide people, especially in this case where you're basically giving them some of their autonomy back if they've lost it or never had it before in their life. Yeah, uh, there's a couple other ones in here, such as universal design. Like these these studies kind of focus on these like universal design and robot surrogates. Um, where uh, specifically the um, universal design is looking at kind of this web-based interface that kind of shows what the world looks like from this robot's head, uh, and it gives them kind of overlaid controls that allow them to, um, you know, basically click on it and and move it in a certain direction. Um, And the screen will kind of, you know, relay this in a way that makes it apparent to them, like, a uh, pair of eyeballs to show where the robot will look when the user clicks it, so that way they kind of know what they're getting in for with all these controls. Uh, the other one here is robot surrogates, um, and uh, this was... Let's see here. Help me out, guys. You know what this really reminds <laughs> me of? This feels like, a, a, a in a very lar- large way, like a application of the Stadia system we just talked about, like giving people a lot more 
you know, experience to like not cutting out any of the latency problems you would see if you're like running a camera and being able to spit it back out through the interface that you're already looking through and then giving people like a, a sense that they're almost embodying the robot itself to be able to take actions throughout their house or whatever maybe that they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one's cool. I like this. I Sorry, guys. We spent so much time on Stadia and the recap that I kind of want to move on. Do it. All right. We got one more, Blake. What's up next? All right. So advances in hardware and software discussed by researchers and entrepreneurs on the stage already a minimum laboratory prototypes. And their developers expect that some of these devices soon will migrate from labs onto people's actual bodies relegating simple step counters and heart rate sensors to retrospective display at the Computer History Museum or IEEE's own Computer uh, Consumer Electronics Hall of Fame. None of these new wearables are guaranteed to succeed in the marketplace, but the technology has clearly evolved rapidly. Though nobody exactly knows what the new applications of wearables and neurotech are going to be, when it hits, people have plenty of great ideas out there. So here's a sample of what's actually going on in terms of gadgets that are coming out and what you might look for next time you're on Amazon. So, Nick, there is a lot of cool wearables coming to people's faces. It yes. Looks like. Let's go down the list, and then we'll talk about ones that sound interesting to us. So there's mind-reading smart glasses, sweat-sensing glasses, goggles that modulate brain waves to eliminate chronic pain. Yes. Uh, a gadget that lets you listen to your body, literally. And a gadget that lets you listen with your body instead of just your ears. So I have uh, here, I'll pick my favorite first and then we'll kind of move down the list. Uh, my favorite here is the um, listening with your body instead of just your ears. I think that one's interesting to me because that kind of opens up uh, a new sensory um, domain that we're not exposed to, right? Like, can you imagine detecting Wi Fi waves with your body? Like that, that's an interesting kind of application, right? Or, or, um, you know, even just, just raw sound, right? You're listening to the podcast, but you're feeling my voice talk to you in your body instead of your ears. That's kind of weird. Don't do that. That sounds real <laughs> weird. I mean, I mean, it, it definitely is a, you know, a sense that the, the, the normal person with, with functioning hearing is, is not accustomed to. Um, you know, I, I took a class in American Sign Language in college, and um, at one point they said, yeah, people who are deaf, you know, can still experience music. It's just different. It's not with your ears. You know, sometimes they'll just blast it and feel the, the rhythm of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and so it's it's something that I have never experienced unless someone drives by me with their music just blaring. But, I mean, it's it's interesting way of experiencing something that you wouldn't normally, you know, put yourself in. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing to me, uh, if you're following along with the article, is under this, this last sentence under the gadget that lets you listen with your body, is he says the gadget can also allow people to listen to signals that have no sound, like changes in the stock market or trends and in information flowing across the internet. Whoa. I wonder what that feels like. Uh, yeah. Well, I'd imagine you'd train your body to listen for certain cues, right? And I, 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 it's like, how many of these things can you stack on top of each other that have uh, distinct sounds to discriminate between them when you're listening to stuff with your body? Oh, yikes. You probably have like so many more, modali more modalities to deal with if yeah. you're like, stacking that many cues up. Can you imagine like you feel a buzz every time you get an email and, and you could almost decipher it, like the contents of it? That'd be weird to me. You're, you're, yeah, you're basically hearing the contents of an email. Yeah. Or hearing the drop turn of the stock market. Turn that stuff off after hours. Oh, goodness. D&D <laughs> &D indeed. <laughs> Just enjoying, uh, you know, movie night with your loved <laughs> one, and all of a sudden, oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Elise, what's your favorite out of these ones? Um, let's see. I'm kind of intrigued by this mind-reading smart glasses. Okay. Um, I, I mean, just the name itself. It's like, hmm. You know, you think back to the Google Glasses, and... At the time, like, it was kind of a bust, right? You know, it was a little bit too soon. People weren't ready. And here we are. We've got, you know, all of these, you know, mind-reading smart glasses being one of them coming out, hitting the market. And I don't know. It's just it's interesting. So they mention technology using, uh, like, eye tracking um, and brain waves to know where you're looking and what you're thinking when you look there. Um, and this might help with things like visual search. That's so, pretty intense. Uh, 
Because they talk a little bit about the there's actual people who are like experts in extracting meaning from those signals that are being captured by these kind of glasses. Right. The thing they don't touch on here that kind of has me a little dubious about this is the application. Like, okay, you're you're collecting data. I'm looking at this advertisement and I'm thinking that's full of shit. You know, like they can yeah. go back and use that data and refine it. And and if they have that much data, then they can make the perfect advertisement for my demographic. And if if they're smart glasses and they're augmented, they can then project a specific advertisement targeted towards me. So it's like, what's the benefit for users in that case, right? Like maybe, maybe you look at an object and think, man, I don't know how to put this thing together, this Ikea furniture. And then, you know, it just taps into Google's data servers and puts an Ikea video right up in your peripheral that says, here, you build it this way. It contextually knows. Uh, so I guess or that's... Or if you like, kind of tie back to the story that we just covered of people who have limited modal, you know, uh, movement, you know, here's, here's another mechanism for you know, those folks to right. be able to manipulate things. Or like search the internet just by looking at something. Like, yeah, okay. All right. Blake. Exactly what you're looking for. All right. I'm all about these goggles that modulate brainwaves to eliminate chronic pain because I just think that's a really awesome kind of premise especially since they're really talking about that there there's a lot of chronic pain that goes like that's often treated by drugs like opiates and things like that and it, getting away from that with you know basically monitoring your own brain waves and trying to reverse it is pretty insane uh, so basically how it works is it looks like it uses patterns of lights and sounds to monitor while monitoring your brain waves and then uses a clo- back, closed feedback system to kind of modulate what you're feeling i mean i don't i just think that has a lot of application especially in the world we live in where we end up in a lot of sedentary lifestyles where we end up with a lot of this chronic pain. So mm-hmm. these kind of things to help modulate that for a lot for, I don't know, at least in America would be just majorly impactful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like not getting at the root of the problem, but it's still treating the problem. So, I mean, yeah, uh, there is that. It's definitely not getting at the root of the problem, but I would rather see people like get relief from something that's modulating their brain no, versus for just sure. like absolutely. taking opiates or something. Oh, like yeah, that, absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. Not arguing with that. I'm just saying it doesn't get to the root of the problem and, you know, maybe maybe they should come up with smart glasses that get rid of the root of the problem. Yeah, maybe you should move. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know what time it is? Uh, you guys know what time it is? What, what time is it? That was a question. Oh, okay, it? all right. It came from... It came from... Okay, it's that part of the show where we look all over Reddit to bring you... Uh, topics the community's talking about and related to human factors. You know, any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Blake, I see you shaking your head at this first one. <laughs> I'm confused about what this is. Yeah. So uh, so I picked this one because it was deleted. And Oh! So this, so this one was deleted, but I think it brings up a good Brought point. Brought back to life. I am bringing this back to life. So if you don't see a link to this, this is because the the post was deleted. Uh, However, we did snag it before then. So this topic here is called tone of voice when speaking to audience. Now, there's we have no specifics. We don't know who the user is. We do know it was on the user experience sub. But I I I want to bring this up because I feel like knowing your audience, either being users or stakeholders. Uh, impacts the way that you deliver information. And I also know that um, your tone drastically changes. So I want to talk to you guys. Like, what, do you, what are you guys thinking? What, uh, let's, let's just do the two groups since we we're short on time. We have users and stakeholders. How would you talk? Like, what kind of tone would you use with users? And what kind of tone would you use with stakeholders? I, so I know these <laughs> tones that I make, and I really don't like them. So with stakeholders or bosses, I tend to get this very, you know, serious, monotone, deep voice that goes on. Because I'm, ver- I'm trying to get to the point and always convey the information like as succinctly as possible and sound like I know what I'm talking about. Whereas with a user, I'm much more, I want to be much more conversational because I want them to feel like I understand their problem. And mm-hmm. I feel like... This is a phrase I'm going to steal from release, but like meeting people where they're at in those kind of instances is really important. And so, yeah. the using a tone that's that's like doesn't make you come off like you're some guy that's a scientist or you're some engineer is super important to me. I want to be able to like have some back and forth that makes it almost feel feel like we're friends or I'm there to help type of thing. Versus like with a boss, it's very serious. Elise, are you serious when you talk to bosses? Very serious. So serious. Um, no, I mean I think that's I'm kind of on the same page with that. With users, 
I mean, it's it's very colloquial, colloquial and formal for the most part. It depends on the user, though. So I think uh, one one thing to mention is is knowing how to read the users. So sometimes you come to them and they've already been working on a system that's extremely frustrating. There are a lot of problems with it. And so they come with a lot of emotional angst. And so I've been in situations where I'm having to represent that system. And so they're like, God, like directing all of that towards me. So I'll immediately change my tone of voice to, you know, okay, like very calm, very neutral, um, you know, tell me more. Why do you think that, you know, that kind of calm voice. And I'll even slow down my pace too, because a lot of times when people get really emotional, like I'm doing right now, they'll talk very fast. And so by you kind of uh, slowing down your tone of voice, you're setting the pace there. So, I mean, I found that that helps. I mean, you can kind of read the room. If, if they're more relaxed, if they're calmer, then you can, you know, kind of get a little bit jokier about it. But um, there's definitely a, a difference with, you know, users versus stakeholders. That's something I want to hit on, too. Like, learning to read the room, no matter who's in it, that's a super oh, important skill. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things when you start your job and if you realize that you've made a mistake, either with a stakeholder, your boss a coworker or users, I mean, just quickly learn from it. Don't beat yourself up about it because you just, you have to learn how to deal with people and yep. know how they're going to react. You can't just assume that you're going to know all the tricks and skills. That's some solid advice, guys. I want to read one more. Uh, is there any way I can enhance my user experience at an entry level job? This is from M serious. Okay. <laughs> from the user experience subreddit. Um, they go on to write, so I was thinking of getting an entry-level job for money while I figure out this whole UX thing. I only have a psychology degree. I was thinking augmented reality, HoloLens, could help me prepare meals for an entry-level position cooking, flipping burgers, uh, while being able to watch TV on the side. Or is there an affordable exoskeleton out there, or even just an arm or a leg, that would give me superhuman strength and make laborious tasks a breeze? They go on to, they, they edited this post. They said, okay, so I found these. Um, Looks like uh, pre-orders for, for glasses, uh, but you can play music from them uh, through bone conduction. You'd be able to listen to podcasts, music, etc., and your boss would have no clue. This could enhance productivity and wake, make work more enjoyable. I want to ask you guys, is there anything available for uh, entry-level positions to make them? Now I understand the question. All right. I was having a really hard time getting with it or, like, trying to wrap my mind around what they were asking. But so... Just to clarify, in case anybody else is confused that's listening to the podcast, I don't know. It seems like they have a job that they just don't necessarily have to do too much thinking for, and they're looking for a way to optimize the time they're spending there. Hey, Blake. Yes. What's today? Today's Monday. What's the date? April Fools? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got him. Got him. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, guys. Insane. <laughs> Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Uh, to the rest of you, you can join us on our discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media at H Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to prank you for April Fools? You can always prank me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Uh, special thanks to Elise Hallett for being on the show. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to chat more healthcare symposium? You can find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Special thanks to Jeff Olson each and every week for video editing. Uh, as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. It depends. It depends.